Hello and welcome to Talking Shop, a podcast from New Syndicalist, a resource for trade union activists. Today we're going to be talking about the recent uh, career organising among uh, Uber Eats and delivery riders. I'm Lydia, I'm a rep in the London branch of the uh, IWW. <laughs> it's important to establish that point. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, I mean, to be fair, we are members of other trade unions as well. Indeed. So, uh, and on that point, I'm Chris. I'm a member of the IWW and NEU, school teacher in the North. Uh, I'm Dave Pike. I am a night rep and also a uh, NEU uh, regional official. I believe that might be fireworks, not gunshots. Just to reassure people. <laughs> Um, seasonal podcast it's a very seasonal podcast yeah uh, for the record that definitely is fireworks uh, <laughs> my name is chris i am the kind of general organizer with the iww couriers network um i'm a member of the iww and i'm kind of doing this interview whilst i'm out delivering hence the news <laughs> Great. <laughs> that was perfectly timed, that explosion. That, that was great. great. Oh. Yeah, we can just get them to like punctuate this conversation. It's yeah. very atmospheric. Um, and then we organised a mass strike. Yeah. <laughs> that is like from the front lines, isn't yeah. it? Jesus Christ. Yeah, God, sorry. <laughs> God, um, Chris, stop organising a revolution. Jeez. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, it's very <laughs> Um, could you, just to begin, could you give us an overview of what's been happening um, sort of within the career network and kind of more broadly what's been going on with the Uber Eats and the riders? Uh, yeah, so basically uh, the IWW started organising couriers in kind of um, about February this year. Um, so it started off with kind of just a one or two uh, couriers in Cardiff um, who got really annoyed at the sort of low boosts and low payments per delivery with Uber and decided to try and organise in their city. And uh, yeah, they had kind of a lot of people interested and they tried this new way of organising where um, they kind of formed like a a collective in their city, I suppose, and sort of um, affiliated that to the wider IWW. So this collective um, was kind of free to join for any courier. They didn't need to be a member of the union if they didn't want to be. Um, And that was kind of a really big draw for um, these couriers. So they ended up having a lot of success and formed a union from it. So that was the first branch of the network. in kind of about March, April this year, um, I, along with some other um, folks in Glasgow, set up a Glasgow branch of the network. So that was our second one. And from that, we also had an Edinburgh branch come out of it. Um, And leading on from that, we've had branches form or kind of close to forming in Bristol, Manchester, Southampton, Portsmouth, um, kind of most of the major cities across the UK have got some kind of IWW courier organising happening in them. Um, Kind of in the most recent months, we've seen a wildcat strike of Uber couriers in London, um, which the IWW was kind of specifically asked by these couriers to get involved in Um, and from that we've kind of set up a a London network essentially um, which is really really positive Um, kind of within the last um, couple of months we've had the first ever national strike of couriers um, in the UK and quite possibly the first ever national strike of the UK IWW so um, we're kind of like in pretty unprecedented territory when it comes to courier organizing at the moment um, yeah so really positive cool um, 
I know that um, a lot of the organising is being coordinated through WhatsApp, um, but I was wondering if riders have been kind of meeting up in person anywhere in the UK, um, whether we think it's like possible or necessary for riders to be meeting up in person rather than kind of through these um, effective, uh, but maybe slightly alienating WhatsApp groups. Yeah, like that's um, kind of a question a lot of people ask me and um in kind of all honesty um Korea is a uh, quite a uh, independent minded um group of people um there's something from kind of riding a bike or a scooter in a busy city that kind of um gives you this sort of militancy and refusal to kind of do things that you don't want to and mm. from when we've been organizing we found that um couriers are kind of quite um they're quite kind of bored by physical meetups like they'll come and talk for a bit but it's kind of really difficult to get couriers to congregate all in one space for kind of mm. a admin meeting or something like that like there definitely is a space for them and we do use them but um it's kind of one of the weird quirks of the job, I think, that um, kind of, yeah, physical meetups are a lot more difficult than in other kind of jobs because you don't really have a workplace, like the streets are your workplace. Mm. Um, trying to um, sort of manufacture a meetup um, to kind of talk about demands and stuff is quite difficult. They do happen, but... Um, like I say, it's very difficult. You kind of find that couriers end up organically congregating in places. Um, so there'll be like a spot in a town or city where most couriers sort of hang out between orders and they'll yeah, normally be there. Cool. Um, I know um, in London that there have been some kind of some quite interesting divides within the delivery and Uber Eats workforce. Um, a lot of those are based around um, nationality, but there's also kind of divides between cyclists and moped riders and um, also between like so-called legal and illegal riders. Uh -huh. um, like h how do you think we can counter these things like effectively in quite an atomized workforce especially kind of as people aren't meeting up so it's kind of you know maybe makes that slightly more difficult yeah definitely um i suppose kind of my approach to it anyway personally when i'm organizing folks is to emphasize the fact that we are all workers at the end of the day all um having our services, if you want to use the kind of Uber speak um, mm. used by the company in question. So we're all selling our labor essentially to the company. And I still think that that's a really big argument that um, I've kind of yet to find any flaw in when it comes to trying to. Um, get different groups with opposing ideas on some things to work together. It generally works in kind of my experience if you stick at it and yeah, you're really determined in trying to break down those barriers. Yeah, I mean, how are you having those conversations on WhatsApp? Um, they're mainly kind of, um, each different city or town has a WhatsApp organizing group. Um, there's also kind of groups for different regions and a national group as well. Um, so kind of a lot of the day to day kind of mundane organizing will happen in these WhatsApp chats. But when there's a really important decision to make, um, like if we're going to go on strike or if there's going to be some kind of action against the restaurant, then we'll call a physical meeting. And um, kind of, yeah, what I was saying about couriers being hard to kind of get to um, meetings sometimes. If it's an important decision, they'll usually turn up. Um, 
there's kind of yeah a lot of intelligence about what kind of events to attend i think so when the meetings are held they're really important ones that folk get out to cool sounds really exciting <laughs> <laughs> yeah i am so sorry it was actually no, no. quiet when i came out <laughs> it's okay, no, it sounds like there's a full-blown revolution going on <laughs> <laughs> just in time for our podcast so is, this, is it so this kind of this kind of divisions in the workforce have you have you come across that a lot is that something that's that has created an issue or is it something that's sort of relatively uncommon um personally in glasgow i haven't come across it that much like you'll get the odd comment from um some courier like an odd racist thing um between kind of different nationalities but usually on the whole um most people kind of are aware of the fact that they're being exploited by these companies and that it doesn't matter what country you come from or what the color of your skin is like you're still being exploited the same as that person so personally i haven't seen much of it in glasgow but i do know it exists across the country and kind of organizing is a good antidote to that um kind of prejudice um like people's presupposed ideas about um yeah race and sort of nationality seem to get like broken down when you go out on strike with other people and you see the solidarity that kind of latently exists between people yeah and i i uh, i had heard as well of the story of uh, porn being shared on a oh. WhatsApp group as well. I've seen quite a lot of porn on the on on one of the London WhatsApp groups. So uh, always slightly jarring experience. Yeah, I know. Um, well, you say that. I know in London, one of the key organisers for the WhatsApp group is really really strict about what gets posted in there. I think yeah. that's probably been. Um, yeah Probably kind of um, yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly it's getting porn posted in it um so yeah that's the thing like usually um they're quite self-regulating with kind of a a group like that where you've got a hundred or like 200 people in it then it is quite difficult to um yeah sort of keep control over the content that gets posted so we're moving towards making these groups strictly for organizing chat like anything that is not related to organizing is not allowed yeah so we're kind of attempting to make it a much more professional way of organizing things as opposed to really noisy mm. do you think that's possibly uh, a limit i mean it sounds like you've addressed it well but do you think that's possibly a limitation of using a medium of communication that tends to be quite informal and people you know it because it, it's internet based it's social media based people often post all kind of inappropriate things all the time is, is that a problem of maybe using something like whatsapp oh yeah definitely like whatsapp is by no means um the perfect organizing system it's just one that's kind of happened to be the sort of organizing um vehicle for couriers just by like necessity because um in a lot of different cities and towns across the uk you'll find that couriers even if they aren't unionized or even if they don't care at all about unionizing they'll have some kind of group chat to um talk about things like talk about which restaurants to avoid talk about areas that it's busy in um stuff like that so kind of these um like digital platforms we've sort of just inherited they're a tool that couriers use to communicate so it kind of makes sense that um sort of if you're organizing then you use that tool but um i do agree about the need to trying to the need to um get couriers to try and build actual physical relationships with each other as opposed to this um highly individualized kind of um atomized sort of existence that the whole sort of um platform economy makes you work on it's kind of like one of 
why one of the key things we've been doing in the network is trying to um, really promote the idea of socials, like getting couriers together um, on a on a kind sorry getting couriers together on a quiet night um, in the week to like just hang out to um, watch films, just talk about the job, talk about anything, just try and um, yeah build like a relationship between people that you would in any other workplace. Yeah. Well, I mean that. that sorry, I know, I know where lydia has got a question to ask as well, but I, I just wanted to because that sort of fed on something I, I wanted to ask you about actually, because obviously I know in the in the IWW you know, organizer training and increasingly in mainstream trade unionism, one to one discussions are such a central part of that. They're such a central part of how you structure your organizing, how you structure that relationship building you're talking about. Um, yeah. So does that still hold true in your sort of career organizing model, the way that you approach it? Do you still use that despite the WhatsApp and the, the other forms of tech that you use? Yeah, definitely. Um, I would say that's kind of, um, yeah, a fundamental part of organizing careers. So you often find that um, you go into a restaurant, it's usually McDonald's if you're working for Uber, which I do, and there'll be a courier there, um, waiting for a delivery so it's kind of in that space that you can have um really important one-on-one -on -one conversations with people because you obviously you don't have a manager working for uber uber have no control over um kind of the restaurant environment that you're in so you can talk yeah. about anything so more often than not couriers will just complain um they'll talk <laughs> about um restaurants that treat them appallingly they'll talk about um kind of issues they're having with the uber app uh, they'll talk about um kind of yeah low boosts and things like that so that moment when you're in a restaurant together is probably um the closest the job comes to actually being in a workplace so that's a really important right. spot for organizing great Thank you. Cool. Um, I just had a question about um, so some of the some of the action um, that the careers have taken has been like really quite um, radical, like really large, noisy <laughs> mobile pickets and uh, quite a like a hands on approach to minimizing scabbing. Um, uh -huh. And uh, just thinking about the kind of re really quite repressive trade union laws in the UK, like how how do we think we should relate to this like is there a danger that um more of sort of official involvement from the iww or other unions getting involved in this kind of organizing could dampen down some of these kind of interesting like very radical tactics um i would say that the only chance of that happening would be if a union got involved that didn't listen to the couriers that it was representing like mm -hmm. to me the whole point of a union is that you represent the um ideas of the people that are your members so it's kind of like completely antithetical to me to kind of like um say you're in a union and you're kind of like a union representing workers and then you do the complete opposite to what they want to do like yeah. couriers are a really militant um bunch of people and i think the whole point that um direct action is kind of one of the tactics that is kind of used the most to win demands um and kind of this job sort of reflects that um sorry okay. i was gonna say another um point there but i completely forgotten well, maybe I, I had a point related to that. So so maybe that would be a good way to bring yes. that in. So a lot of the so you talked about the fact that if a union came in that didn't listen to the careers, then that would create a problem. A lot of the bigger trade unions, TUC associated unions, seem to be imitating some of the tactics of base unions, militant unions like the IWW in similar areas mm -hmm. to the careers. So we could look at the fast food strikes, Baker's Union, Weatherspoon strikes, these are uh, imitations, repetitions of things that 
the IWW did in the States, things that have been done in Starbucks, things that have been done in, yeah. in the service industry. Are you worried that a union with a larger infrastructure could come along and compete with the campaign that you're currently running or do a poor imitation of it? Um, that's a, a really important question. Um, it's quite funny kind of to see the mainstream unions um, start trying to, um, for want of a better word, like capitalize on the um, organizing that's already been done because they tried doing it before. Like a couple of years ago, Unite tried organizing delivery workers in Edinburgh and completely failed because they went in with a preconceived idea of what couriers actually wanted. Um, so the sort of mainstream union view is that all couriers are downtrodden, expressed, um, oppressed victims of kind of the platform giants with no agency at all. Um, and that they all want worker status. Like everybody wants to be employed as an official employee. Um, and when we started organizing in the IWW, we found that to be the complete opposite to what couriers actually want. Um, we went in and spoke to couriers and just asked them, what do you want? And their reply was just better conditions, better pay. Um, like they really aren't that concerned about um, the nitty gritty of like legal status and employee status and things like that. They just want their bread and butter conditions to improve. Um, kind of obviously that whole argument about worker status is a really important one. And um, it's it will have a, a really big impact on couriers conditions going forward. But that's kind of like a long term fight. And the couriers themselves need to be convinced or kind of that debate needs to be had with the couriers by actually kind of engaging with them rather than just coming along and telling them that this is what they want. Um, so kind of in answer to that question about if we're sort of worried about um, mainstream unions kind of um, getting involved and trying to um, sort of, yeah, muscle in on the campaign. Um, I would not say worried so much. I just say kind of frustrated because I know that if these mainstream unions try and get involved, they won't really listen to what the couriers are saying. Mm -hmm. And I think that that will ultimately mean that the whole organizing that's being done will just completely fail. Um, so it is kind of a really pressing question, that one. And yeah, it needs some answers pretty quick. Well, I, I, it's it's funny because I, I think there's that there is that obsession, isn't there, with the sort of terminology of worker led, right? And and it's it's yeah, it, it's a mantra of the trade union movement, whether they actually do it or not. You know, mm -hmm. every every trade union in the country will say worker led, worker led, worker led, but they don't actually do that. And it's almost like, and you, you do look you look at things like the sort of gig economy, and it's it's all the research saying that people like the freedom, blah, blah, blah. And it's almost like yeah. every trade union in the country has stuck their fingers in their ears and go, no, that yeah. can't possibly be true. That can't possibly be yeah. true. People want contracts and nine to five. They don't want freedom, you know, and it, it, it is, it's just that kind of inability to actually listen to that. I think well, I do wonder yeah. just on that point, I wonder whether it is a bit sectional as well mm -hmm. in the sense that, those mainstream trade unions are looking at the gig economy with worry and concern. Yeah. Yeah. They're thinking about their members' yeah. interests and they're saying, no, you need to be like us because yeah. we can't accept that form of work yeah. rather than actually listening to what people want. Yeah. I mean, to me, what yeah. you're saying, Chris, makes a lot of sense that it's, bread, it's always bread and butter issues yeah. and every workplace is always bread and butter issues. Yeah. People ultimately care about what they're paid and how they're treated at work. Yeah. And actually, I think... Yeah, in the long term, like you said, worker status would have an effect on that. But immediately, it's your pay packet, isn't it? That's what affects day to day how yeah. you experience yeah. work and the quality and of life that you get from it. Completely. And like at the moment, um, it just seems bizarre to me to focus on worker status as an issue when you actually have couriers in some part of the 
some parts of the country at some times of the year um going out for five hours at a time and making like six pound for the entire shift like why on earth you would focus on a lofty legal campaign um or kind of a legal argument rather than focusing on trying to get that workers wage up um like right now just seems bizarre to me well i think it, it's funny isn't it because it this isn't this isn't a new mistake that the trade unions have made this is a mistake that the trade union movement has made time and time again is the inability to to organize represent or understand in new forms of work or even in very old <laughs> forms of work to be fair you know so for example unison has really struggled with any of them members going over to the private sector instead of the public sector they really yeah. struggle with that you know and yeah and that isn't that much of a shift really you know um mm. i mean what are some of i mean obviously you've talked about those bread and butter issues such as yeah. pay what are some of the other real bread and butter issues that you come across for for the riders um so yeah obviously we've got pay like mm -hmm. you were saying that's a flat demand for five pound per drop across uber and delivery um the other kind of really key issues are we want some kind of um protection in place to sort of safeguard couriers against sexual harassment in restaurants like couriering is it's got kind of a predominantly male workforce but there are a lot of um female and non-binary couriers too and um, they're kind of often disproportionately affected by um, sexual harassment when they're out delivering and Uber and delivery really don't seem to care about it at all. So that's a key kind of demand we're mm -hmm. making. Um, also, safety is a really big one and kind of insurance and sick pay. Like if you're out delivering and you get hit by a car and you break your leg uh that means you can't earn money for months whilst your leg heals and um yeah if you can't earn money you can't pay your bills you can't eat um and you get into a really bad place so we want kind of a proper um insurance system in place that isn't just the kind of basic bare bones kind of thing that uber and delivery of magic up at the moment uh we also just want to be treated with respect and listened yeah. to like um uber I, i'm kind of disproportionately talking about uber because i kind of work for them so I'm, yeah yeah, yeah i've no, got a lot of stuff to say about them but um every so often uh well they kind of make a whole point about trying to be seen to actually engage with couriers um when they do the complete opposite every yeah. so often they hold these things called feedback sessions where they invite a bunch of <laughs> sounds <couriers>. horrible <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, believe me, they are yeah. um <laughs> they invite a bunch of couriers into that office they get a bunch of donuts give you all one donut each um, <laughs> just one donut one yeah. donut no more <laughs> ask you about how the job is going um ask you about things that you want improved so you have all these couriers tell them what they want improved they want faster waiting times at restaurants they want um better insurance and kind of better sick pay uh they want yeah five pound a drop they want um kind of protection against sexual harassment and violence all of these kind of things yeah. the uber managers sit there listen maybe even take notes um and kind of nod along say um oh yeah that's really important we'll try and do something about that and the meeting finishes they go away and nothing changes at all um even the really specific things that are relatively easy that could be fixed they just completely ignore so most couriers have cottoned on to the fact that this is just a face saving exercise just a way of uber making it look like they're engaging with couriers and kind of um i mean it's, it's, a, it's a it's a union busting tactic as well yeah, yeah. just about to say that yeah yeah <laughs> um kind of yeah like um 
yeah sort of um employee groups at other workplaces to try and um yeah circumvent having a union involved oh there's no need to get a union involved because we listen to you um, yeah, which is course. like yeah. the complete opposite I mean that follows on to my next question quite well actually I mean I know from organizing my own workplace it was such a political awakening for me um yeah. how are you finding that from your perspective then so you know how has that been for you personally as well but what is the yeah. future for how that's politicizing uh career riders as well do we think there's um those involved are getting an idea of how this fits into a wider system you know are people being radicalized by this i know we're seeing a lot of activity but is that is that radicalizing people long term do you think i think yeah i think the seeds are definitely being sown there um i think this whole kind of wave of action is kind of showing couriers that they have the ability to change things and to stand up for themselves if they can be bothered to do it um like you you sort of um see whilst you're organizing people starting to question things that they've never done before you kind of start to see the cogs were around in their head which is um amazing um kind of yeah things i've sort of seen whilst organizing is people kind of realizing that um the whole kind of concept of um surplus value and kind of um your labor being uh, exploited and you not being paid the fair rate for it without even needing to read marks like they just see it um, yeah Right. They don't read marks. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, completely. Chris is crying um, right now. He's in that. How do they have an <laughs> understanding of the concrete workings of the economic system? <laughs> I, I hope well, you have sat down with people and gone through about the like value of a shoe or something like that. Oh yeah, Just completely. Oh, I've gone through oh, many, oh, many pages. Oh my clients. god, I'm really sorry. I'm the linen. Linen. Yeah. Oh, that's what I was, was going to say. So I've much linen. The whole mechanics of the linen industry in manchester in the 1860s don't worry um i will uh, then yeah in terms of like um my own kind of political um awareness or kind of like how i've developed politically whilst organizing people um it, it's been like really fascinating and i would definitely encourage any person with an interest to try and organize people because it will enable you to learn so much about all of these kind of political issues and words that we bandy about but never really understand like I thought I understood what solidarity was and kind of um thought yeah when I seen strikes and other unions coming along to picket lines and showing up I kind of thought oh that's nice but um in my mind (laughs) I'd never really appreciated what it actually feels like to be striking to be like stood in the pouring rain and like another union and people from that other union coming down and standing with you on the same picket line like it's really hard to put into words how incredible it is um yeah and kind of it's proved all of my sort of political um ideas kind of correct in a way like i've seen limitations in them but i've also seen yeah kind of the positives and reasons to keep on fighting yeah and i think that's that's a really good thing i mean like and and something that that has always bothered me is almost like the the overly critical term in which we use to describe someone who's like an activist who's who's politically minded that's just someone who could be a great organizer you know there's there's no reason to be dismissive of that person just because they're oh, oh, they're just in it because they're like political or whatever mm. like like yeah, there's exactly. some sort of magical mythical worker out there that we need to find before we can have a real organizer you know those <laughs> yeah, those of us ideology who've got to, free yeah, yeah yeah the completely ideologically free worker somewhere over there we will find one day and they will be the real just organizer think about spanners and yeah yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> Um, so you spoke earlier about how the network evolved and developed. 
and the career network is using this kind of network unionism model. Um, I, I wanted to ask two questions about that. The first is, for you, is that a pragmatic choice? So is that just because that is how careers are, are finding the union, joining the union, moving with the union? Or is it yeah. a necessary step um, to moving to bigger, more coherent things? So in essence, is it going to stay a network in the future? Or is it going to evolve into something different? And, and with that in mind, have you thought about retention uh, and keeping people involved and on board, given that they're not dues paying members, they're not taking out membership cards? Yeah, that's a, a really interesting question. Um, kind of the network model, like most things with kind of the organizing we've done, um, it's kind of evolved naturally. Um, Nobody really sat down and went through tons of books and came up with this um, kind of free of um, organizing people. Like we just tried different methods to see what would work. And this one has worked. So um, truth be told, no one really knows how it will evolve. Like how it will evolve will kind of depend on what couriers want and what works and what doesn't work um kind of one of the beauties of the network system um is kind of the way it copes with high turnover of people um mm -hmm. cuz obviously couriering yeah is a really high turnover job um you, you're unlikely to kind of stay in the job forever so you've got a constant uh fresh wave of faces coming along and that's kind of one of the reasons why the mainstream union approach of trying to get as many members as possible and getting them to sign up and pay dues just hasn't worked because a lot of couriers don't see this as a permanent job and if you don't see it as a permanent job it's unlikely that you're gonna want to pay um, like a proportion of your wages each month for a membership um so we've kind of um yeah kind of developed the whole sort of free membership of the network model in response to, response to that um in terms of like being financially sustainable um the benefit to the wider iww in terms of increased press coverage from the successes that we're getting and the actions that we're organizing uh, contributing to a massive spike in membership. It's getting the word about the IWW out to the wider public for quite possibly like the first time I've ever seen in the UK, especially since Definitely. being a member. Yeah. Um, yeah. So like within the union, there are some people who argue that, um, like this network model is a waste of time because it's not um like contributing masses of members straight away to the union but the point is that it's a slow going process you need to convince couriers about the worth of actually being in a union and mm. some couriers are actually seeing this and we're getting a lot more couriers join the union now but it's not something that's going to happen overnight. Like you need to treat people with intelligence and prove to them why they should join you before you just, um, yeah, kind of blindly expect them to join something. Mm, that, re that reminds me actually of a, a very old uh, organizing text from Recomposition, actually, which is the blog, the American-based IWW blog uh -huh. that uh, was we inspired us to yep. do new to do new syndicalist oh, cool. uh, and they had an article in which they talked about how people fell into different categories when they were joining unions so there were people who knew the union and they were already uh, sort of ideologically on board you don't need to persuade them they're going to join when they hear that there's a union mm. in the workplace there's people who need to hear the union as in they need to hear rumors in their workplace that people around them you know, John or Jane has joined, yeah. also I'll join as well. And then there's 
probably where the bulk of people sit, which is that they need to see the union, as in they need to see the union in action, winning stuff, yeah. Yeah. acting like yeah. a union before they're willing to mm-hmm. get on board. And that does put us in a little bit of a, a paradoxical position because it's basically saying that people will join unions when unions are big and successful. <laughs> yeah. Well, obviously, we need people to join unions for them to be big and successful. But this network model is an interesting way of tackling that problem, mm-hmm. I think. Yeah. We've got the, in London, we're fine. We find that a lot of people kind of just don't really know what, not just what the IWW can do, but what a union can do at yeah. all. Um, so it is a, a massive ask to, you know, for to ask people to pay even, you know, a quid a month for something which they have no idea about really like and seeing it in action is obviously the best way to learn you know what a union is what a union does um yeah I mean I think it definitely is a like a show don't tell kind of thing it's really important yeah that experience, really, uh, sorry go ahead Chris oh sorry I was just going to say I completely agree with that um like one of the most common conversations I have with couriers when I'm trying to organize them is literally what is a union explain to me how a union works um like that whole um knowledge of kind of trade unionism has to be reinstilled in people because a lot of them have yeah just have no idea about it nobody's ever approached them telling them what it is at all so people need to be educated about it really but that's something i found a lot in my experience yeah. and I think I think that's exactly right I mean that the the reality is that experience of being on the picket line that experience of dispute that experience of standing up for yourself just doesn't go away does it you don't you don't forget no. that overnight and that is something that sticks with people that's something we get mm. that that taking people through that experience sticks with them regardless of where they end up at next yeah, mm. yeah completely so the other point I wanted to talk about was that Uber, Deliveroo and, the, and other career companies are international global firms. They have international reach. This campaign, this struggle increasingly has an international dimension. I know there's been yep. quite an important meeting in the last couple of weeks. I wondered if you could talk about how this campaign, how this struggle is evolving on an international stage. Yeah, definitely. Um, so in the last week of October, um, the first ever international meeting of self-organized courier collectives and kind of grassroots courier unions took place in Brussels in Belgium. Um, it was kind of like a invite affair. Uh, the IWW Courier Network got invited along um, by our pals in the IWGB which was really nice of them. Um, So we came along to that. Um, There was kind of... You make it sound really glitzy, like in my (laughs) own way, like red carpet. Yeah, I know. Um, It was... (laughs) um, Yeah. Uh, It was was actually quite glitzy in terms of, like, the food we got (laughs) served and stuff. Like, um, yeah, I can understand why some people become, like... um, full-time trade unionists now but um <laughs> yeah some, some people some people yeah become, become um, chunky, anyway. chunky trade union bureaucrats listen yeah, i'm trying completely. to say out i'm working out man <laughs> uh definitely um yeah so there was i think um about 30 34 uh courier collectors and unions from across europe so uh we had like the CLAP from France, the CGT also from France, uh, Riders Derechos from Spain, uh, the FAU from Germany, um, some uh, self-organized collectives from Italy, like the Riders Bologna um, and the Riders Padova, um, just all over Europe also, um, some really interesting folks in Finland um, who've started up a syndicalist collective as well, which is really interesting. Um, So yeah, there was all of these groups of um, couriers that met and the whole purpose of the meeting was to try and work out how we could coordinate our 
different struggles and our demands on a transnational scale. Um, so it was kind of an event over two days. Uh, we spoke about all of the different situations in our countries and tried to come up with a shared set of demands. Um, at the end of the conference, um, we managed to agree them and decided to set up a kind of a federation essentially. So um, it's called the Transnational Federation of Couriers. Um, so as far as we know, it's yeah, like the first um, international group that's come out of kind of um, the gig economy and precarious work. So it's really interesting and I felt really proud to um be kind of like repping the IWW in it um As you it was be. Fantastic. yeah yeah it's amazing um I mean, but yeah it was way better such... that's way better than any international pop can ever did that's way better <laughs> <laughs> yeah. way better <laughs> I was gonna make a really obscure historical point about him him advocating um, the anarchist movement giving up terrorism at the international meeting that he attended. <laughs> I'm gonna leave that. I'm not gonna make that obscure historical I was point. gonna make an obscure point about watchmakers, but yeah, no, that's <laughs> oh, that's, that's Bakunin, that's not oh. Kapotkin. Oh, is it? Oh, yeah, right, oh fair enough. <laughs> I'm getting my I'm getting my anarchist. You're getting your up. anarchist internationals yeah. mixed up. Oh, oh, damn understandable. <laughs> They're not very um, international. <laughs> um, yeah, this one actually did feel really international. Like um, the language barriers were kind of um, completely torn down because um, there was like tons of translators. So um, all of the kind of things that were talked about were translated into um, French, German, Italian and English and Spanish. So everyone knew what everybody else was um, saying, yeah, which was incredible to sort of see. It was such an inspiring event. Um, and it's probably, yeah, something I'll not forget um, in a while. At the end of it, um, there was a huge critical mass in um, central Brussels. So critical mass, if you don't know or your kind of listeners don't know, it's a kind of... Um, huge bike ride that aims to kind of i don't know how you'd say it kind of um counteract the dominance of cars in a city and yeah. replacing it with bikes so this huge um convoy of um bikes with music and um shouting and singing just shut down the center of brussels like there must have been about a thousand bikes there which was incredible Wow, that's really inspiring. Yeah, that's that's amazing. amazing. Um, well, given that, I think one well, one thing I want to ask about then is how do people listening to this podcast get more involved? Um, firstly, how can people who want to su either support the Couriers Network or who are couriers themselves effectively reach out to other riders yeah. and really important to that what would be some key advice that you'd give to those wanting to organize one careers right um i would say to those people um we need as many people on the ground going out and talking to couriers and telling them about unions and the successes we've been having um and just kind of fostering that questioning and debate amongst couriers so i would say to them get in touch with me um my email address is couriers.network at iww.org.uk and i will send you out all of the materials you'll need we've got um business kind of i say business cards we've got cards with sort of information on it um about organizing and stuff we've got stickers we've got badges so just send me your details and i'll send them out to you completely for free um we need Great. yeah just that kind of grassroots organizing happening constantly um yeah we'll other, post that up on our website as well oh yeah, thank yeah. you that would be amazing um other couriers the advice would be kind of similar but just every time you see a courier speak to them 
um, and ask them, well, kind of actually this applies to just anyone organizing. Um, when you're organizing couriers, the kind of key thing to remember is don't come along with any preconceived ideas of what you expect the job to be like or what you expect someone's experience to be like. Um, so kind of case in point, the worker status issue. Um, you often find that if you kind of approach someone and you're like, hey, why don't you organize so that you can become a um, fully certified employee? Um, like, don't you think this is a great thing? Um, people will just look at you like you've come from the moon or something. And like, it's not really an effective way to get people fired up and involved. I found the thing that works the most is just listening to people, asking them how their day's going, what they're finding good, what they're finding bad, and then just um, opening a conversation with them, getting them to question, um, well, if things are bad, why are they bad? If you're not making, if you're not making at least minimum wage an hour, why is that the case? Um, is it something to do with like how fast you're cycling or is it actually to do with the fact that the app is weighted against you in terms of making money just kind of getting right. these conversations mm -hmm. happening yeah that's great thank you chris um that's really helpful um i want to extend our thanks from from all of us at new syndicalist for chris for coming on especially on shift and yeah. talking oh, in such no detail about thank you so much. what's been going on um, there's only one last thing that we need to do to close up Talking Shop. Um, we all know whose responsibility it is. <laughs> now, Dave has been doing a bit of research to prepare himself <laughs> for this important and vital job. I think that that's too easy. I think you should at least include reference to one anarchist figure oh in an God. international socialist oh. organisation <laughs> in your sign-off. Okay. Uh... To redeem yourself for confusing Bakunin and Kropotkin. <laughs> 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 okay, uh, I was going to go for good night and good luck, but uh, I think I already used that one. Is that the one I used last time? Uh, you might have possibly used yeah, that God last damn time. It. it does, it yeah. does, God damn it. Um, if you'd said it in, in Swiss or... Oh, or, or, yeah, oh God damn it, I haven't been working on my Swiss. <laughs> oh, what? Yeah, anyway. It's not a language. I know, I was say, as soon as I said it, as soon as I said it. I was thinking, is Swiss a language? No, no I don't think it is. Uh, German, French, and a mixture of We should both. have known that. We were there. We For were an international. For an international. anarchist international. And we are both. Italian. Oh, an Italian, oh, that's you. the one. Ooh, yeah. So Lydia knows more about Switzerland, even, even though we've been we've there. We've been there together. To been a, there too. A, oh, okay. Well, Lydia was paying attention. <laughs> Yeah. To be yeah. fair, when we were there, we were just getting very, very grumpy at yeah. the international anarchist and movement cold. and cold. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was and a distraction. I was, I, was <laughs> I was 12 and I was playing in a school orchestra. So I do a bit less what rock we and roll. do. Oh, God, that's awful. Right. <laughs> so, uh, and that's the way Bakun and Crumbles. <laughs> <Yes>! <laughs> Nice, that's brilliant. Finally, a sign off the work. Success! Yay! It's only took four episodes. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you for listening, everyone. Catch you next time. Thanks. Cheers. Bye.